Plexus all the way from Lauren. Good to have you join us. I see you, Kelvin. Thanks for joining. All the way from Bauchi. Safia from Kaduna. I see you too. Thanks for joining. Those of all just joining, uh, giving a few minutes for others to join. While we wait, just quickly introduce yourself in the chat box and tell us where you are joining us from. Okay, I see you as well from FCT. I see you, Uchi, all the way from Kigali. Thanks for joining. Muhammad from Kano. See you too. Welcome to you.
All right, I think we've given enough time for others to join. And we'll just kickstart this session now. Um, if you are just joining us, welcome to the Solina Capacity Building Webinar. Uh, this is team staying healthy to achieve more. If you are just joining, uh, drop your name and we are joining us from in the chat box. So we get to meet you and we know who is on the call and paying attention to us. All right, thanks everyone. So um, a quick question um, to you is, would you, would you like to live in a place where um, there's no water supply, where water is cut off, you have no water supply? I'm guessing the answer is no. Would you like to live in a place, <laughs> I see you at Davis, would you like to live in a place where probably is on lockdown, you're not allowed to leave your house, you stay indoors all day, and right there in your house, no, you're not allowed to come out, no sunlight, nothing like that. The only kind of light you're exposed to are the UV rays of your TV or your phone. I'm guessing the answer is no too. Would you like to stay in a place where also very similar to that is you, you actually are forced to stay awake all day. There's no sleep for you. So you stay awake all day and while you're awake, you are forced to watch your leader or the president of that place day and night, morning to, morning to evening, even throughout the night, just watch him talk about his achievements and himself. I'm guessing the answer is no too. But this experience I just laid out describes some of us on this call because we are that leader, right? If you think of our bodies as actually the, the our subjects, and you see that we force ourselves to do a number of things, no exercise, no form of physical activity. So we then reduce our bodies and our, our parts to just stay in one chair all day, all night, stay in the bed all day, all night, right? No exercise, nothing. Rather than going out in, uh, and do partake in physical activities, we are more pressing our phones day and night. So when it comes to whom I need someone like vitamin D, right? What we are exposed to is the light from our phones. The recommendation is drink how many glasses of water per day? Drink water or don't drink water. A lot of us still say what you want to drink is Fanta and Coke, no water, right? And we see that that's really us doing that to our bodies. Sleep, no one want to watch movie all through the night. And so why we are here today is really to think about and understand how best to actually treat our bodies right. Because if we want to achieve, right, it's really with our bodies. We need to have our bodies work optimally to achieve more, right? So we need to treat our bodies like our subjects and give them what they really need and know what uh, is maybe pleasing to us at that very moment, right? So that's why we are here today. And um, today's uh, webinar, like I've mentioned a number of times, is staying healthy to achieve more. We have a lot of experts uh, in our midst. We'll be using the panel format for this webinar. So it means you'll be able to ask questions to the panelists, whatever question you have on health, whatever question are debugging you, you have the opportunity to ask today. And we have a lot of experts from different areas for, for this exercise. We have uh, someone from psychology. So if you have questions of mental health, a lot of people talk about my mental health, um, like this is not good for my mental health, this is not good for me, for this. This is an opportunity to talk about that. Let's ask questions. Let's know what does that even really mean? <laughs> that we can really do to actually put us in a better place. Yeah, uh, it's a therapist here. Yeah. So a lot of questions and things around wow, my back ache, my neck ache, and all that. So we have the opportunity here today to actually ask questions around what should I do? What posture should I take? What are the things I could do to prevent this? Because if I already have it, what are the things I can do to actually um, get to it. So today is also the opportunity to ask those questions. We also have in our midst someone from neurology. So things around brain and stroke and questions like headaches. People complain, I have risk recurring headaches that's always there, migraine and all. Oh, I can't concentrate and look at my screen. We have a neurologist. Yeah, as part of the panelists that will be answering those specific questions that we have and um, put us on the right path to stay healthy. And last, we also have a general practitioner. So we general medicine and general things. Some people I've spoken with have mentioned how they take a lot of painkillers, uh, anything, I just throw some tablets into my mouth every single time, or I want to sleep, I'm finally going to sleep, throw some sleeping pills into the mouth. 
how much of that creates too much? Are we really uh, doing the right thing? These are opportunities for us to ask those questions. Um, our experts, our panelists, which we'll introduce later, will be here to answer those questions for us. So I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting session. Uh, looking forward to your to engaging with you throughout the session and um, looking forward to at the end of the day uh, actually practicing these healthy habits that will help us achieve more. So moving straight into it, we have a speaker in our midst that will kick off this webinar. She'll be speaking to us on this theme, staying healthy to achieve more. And she's going to tell us why this is relevant and how we can use this and why we are going here in the first place. Why, why are we trying to stay healthy? Is health, healthy living tied to achieving more? She's going to tell us. So I'm going to introduce the speaker right now. She's somebody we might know quite so well. Uh, she's a medical doctor and has a lot over seven years of experience, um, both in the clinical and the non-clinical uh, side of medicine. Um, she's someone here yeah, that has worked in a number of projects, including it was here in SIDA on the HIV program. She's no other person but Dr. Jumoke or Dekumbi. Please, in the chat session, you can put your hands together for her, and I hand over to her right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Efosa. Thank you, Adebisi. I see you. Good evening, everyone. That was such a robust welcome address. It feels like you've given the pen up already. But then, since I still have some time, I will um, share my perspective of the topic. But I think it's important to acknowledge the efforts of the organizers, slash planners of this event. Thank you for putting this together. Now to the business of the evening, staying healthy to achieve more. What does this mean? What's the implication of staying healthy as concerning our health? How do we stay healthy? Why should we stay healthy? But before I um, start the talk proper, I'd like to ask two questions, hoping for responses in the chat box. So the first question um, is this, is there any difference in terms of functionality of a properly maintained car and one that is poorly maintained? That's the first question. I'll take it again. Is there any difference between a poorly maintained car and one that's um, well-maintained in terms of functionality? If you think there would be any difference, please leave it in the chat box. The second question, if you have a car, whether it's new or you've had it for some time, but you're really just hoping to improve the functionality of the car, you want it to save you better, what steps would you take? All right, I immediately think there would be a difference. What would the difference be? More responses, please. No difference initially. Okay, and then what happens later, Victor? Please feel free to share what you think about my question. There's, there's no wrong answer, there's no right answer, or maybe every answer is right. Sorry, I missed the question. Okay, so I asked two questions, um, Tokwe. The first is that in terms of functionality or performance of automobiles, will there be any difference between a well-maintained car and one that is poorly maintained? If you think there'll be any difference, share what the differences would be. And then the second question, if you own a vehicle, and you want to improve the performance, what would you do? What steps would you take? All right, so everybody thinks there would be a difference. I right, thank you. What would the difference be though? Nobody has said anything in that regards. The poorly maintained vehicle breaks down more often. All right, thank you, Victor. Second question, Dr. Thanks. It should be a routine. Okay, what would this routine include? That's what I want to hear, or what I want to see. What would you do to make your car serve you better? Okay, top says maintenance and good usage. Kletu says there would be a lot of differences, obviously, 
uh, to improve functionality, I'll go for checkups by specialists, preventative maintenance, use of quality parts. All right, thank you. I mean, I really just wanted to know um, how other people view this topic and to see if anyone would see it differently from me. And I agree with a lot of responses that a well-maintained car would save you way better than a poorly maintained vehicle. It then brings me to the next question, which I don't need um, an answer for really. If we think maintaining a car would help the car save us better, why do we think we are any different? Why don't we care so much about ourselves? Why don't we um, bother about how we use ourselves in quotes? Why do we use ourselves anyhow without paying attention to stress limits, without going for routine maintenance and all of that? I mean, the responses to my questions sort of sums up what we are here to discuss this evening. If you want your body to save you better, you want your mind to save you better, you certainly have to stay healthy. You have to put in some work as regards routine maintenance. So I'll just get um, into the talk now. And I'd already mentioned that we'll be looking at the what, the why, and the how. So what is health? What does health mean? What does it mean to be healthy? According to the World Health Organization, health is defined as the complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of the disease. So commonly, when people say a person is sick, or yes, a person is sick, most of the time, what we're thinking of is there's a physical illness, forgetting that there are other components to health outside of the physical um, parts. So if, for example, a car has a dent, on the body or there's even something wrong with the engine. I mean, I'm not very familiar with all of the engine parts. I would have mentioned the specific parts, but then there are parts of a car that can be faulty, but the car will still work. I, I believe that is true. So the owner of the vehicle knows at that point that even though the car is moving, it can move from point A to point B. It's not entirely well. That's the same thing with humans. So if you're not, um, if you're not at a complete, um, well-being in terms of your physical components, your mental components, and your social components. We cannot say that person is healthy. Does this mean that we have to attain a state of health at every point? I don't think that's realistic. It's not possible that every time you're healthy. From time to time, maybe work stress, family issues, the happenings around us in the society, they would get to us and then we may fall sick. But the important part is even when we fall sick, we should make efforts to go back to a state of health. And more importantly, we should focus on taking out those things that have detrimental effects on our health. And I imagine that somebody mentioned, I think it was Stockley or Victor, I'm not sure, but somebody mentioned that if they want to improve the functionality of their vehicle, they will go for routine maintenance. That's not something we commonly do. We don't go to the hospital until we're sick or there's a reason for us to go. I've met people who said, oh, all my life I haven't been to a hospital. And they say that as a testament to the fact that they hardly fall sick, which in itself is not bad. But we often forget that there are some illnesses that will not manifest with any physical um, symptom until they've gotten to a complicated state. But for such illnesses, if we're able to, if we go for routine screenings, or yes, just routine treatment will start immediately, of course, which would further improve the treatment outcomes. Now, why do we need to take care of them, family, friends, and all of those things? The second thing is, if you're not healthy, it becomes difficult to chase dreams or goals, whether personal goals, family goals, organizational goals, or what, what it is to you. So you need to be at a state of health to be able to pursue those dreams or goals that you have set for yourself. The third reason why we need to pursue health is because the cost of accessing quality health care has increasingly gone up, especially with the mass exodus of healthcare workers in recent times. So I, I saw an article that was published by Premium Times NG last week, and it said that the doctor to patient ratio in Nigeria right now is one to over 9,000. That's very worrisome. 
and I don't ever think it's going to get better anytime soon because I mean, people are still moving. So why do we want to get to the point where we're sick and we need doctors when we can improve on our health by really just changing certain behaviors or changing certain habits or changing our diets even? All right, so how then do we stay healthy? I mean, specialists are here and I believe that you'll be shedding a lot of light. but just as a way of some if our mindset is such that we're seeking to do the company we keep and all of those things the amount of i don't all right sorry about that we had a technical glitch I'm not sure the last thing that was heard to. But I was saying, yes. Yeah, so I said the first and um, very important step in seeking health is to have a mindset that is stayed on just improving your health generally, which would then inform the choices that you make as um, concerning your health. And then the next thing is lifestyle adjustment. So it's important to balance work and rest. If you don't get adequate sleep, it reduces the body's um, functionality it impairs judgment it's also a risk factor for a lot of chronic illnesses so why do you want to um, shortchange yourself in terms of health when you really can just prevent certain things by resting enough also we want to encourage active lifestyle knowing that being sedentary predisposes you to other illnesses to chronic illnesses alongside some mental issues like anxiety, depression, and all of that. So it's important to get enough rest. It's important to exercise. And exercise is not just um, for people who are on the big side, on the big side, because people say, oh, I'm slim, or I'm lean, or I'm even underweight. Why do I need to exercise? It goes beyond that, really. Uh, next thing is dietary adjustments. Of course, for want of time, I'm not able to list specifics. But each time you want to eat or drink something, ask yourself, would this be adding to my health or would it be taking away from it? Let the response guide you so that you know what to eat and what to eat, uh, what not to eat. All right, so uh, I'll wrap up by saying preventive medicine is something everybody should embrace. So this is the aspect of medicine that aims to reduce diseases. So it includes vaccinations, it includes going for routine screenings and tests. So we don't want to wait until we're sick to go to a hospital. The hospital is not there just for sick people. It's also there to educate us, counsel us, so that we know the right uh, health choices to make. Thank you for staying with me. Over to you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jumoke. Hello again, everyone. Um, so. For those who just joined us, welcome. Uh, this is the Staying Healthy to Achieve More webinar uh, hosted by CEDA. So welcome again. Thank you, Jumoke, for that beautiful presentation. I've never been compared to a car before, but <laughs> it's interesting, you know, to, if we think about it that way, then we're going to get more serious with ensuring that, like she said, we practice preventive uh, medicine before it happens, let's maintain so that we don't break down. So at this time, I would like to welcome our very special guests, our panelists for today's session. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to be here. So I'm just going to introduce them one after the other very, very quickly. Uh, so the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Yusuf, Yusuf Zubair. He's an internal medicine physician and neurologist. He's a senior consultant at the Defense Hospital Abuja and also he consults at the National Hospital in Abuja as well. He has over 10 years of experience in neurology practice with keen interest in epilepsy, headache, stroke, and those kinds of illnesses. And he also has over 13 years experience in the management of chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes. The next speaker 
welcome, Dr. Zubair. We're going to come to you in a minute to unmute and speak. The next speaker is Dr. Victoria Awoshika. She is a physiotherapist and a member of the Medical Rehabilitation Board of Nigeria. She's the head of the Department of Physiotherapy at the Defense Hospital in Abuja. And she has over 13 years experience in physiotherapy practice with keen interest in orthopedics and neurophysiotherapy. Welcome Dr. Awoshika, thank you for making the time to be here. Our third panelist is Dr. Bonjibola Abiri. She is a consultant psychiatrist lecturer, managerial psychologist, professional speaker, and the CEO of Ready Med Consulting Services. She has co-authored two books, one on mental health in the workplace, I'm sure we'll want to read that, and the Handbook of Forensic Mental Health in Africa. She's also the pioneer of Nigeria's first mental health advocacy digital network that, you know, airs on YouTube. And last but definitely not the least, is Dr. Edegbini Omokudu. You're gonna to have to forgive me. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce that correctly. Dr. Edegbini is a health and wellness expert who heads the preventives and wellness team at AXA Mansard Health. He earned his qualification from the University of Ghana Medical School and Windsor University School of Medicine. He's a speaker, story consultant, author, and scriptwriter. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please just chat box to put your hands together <laughs> for our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, I would appreciate it if you can all just turn on your screen, uh, turn on your video, pardon me, turn on your video at this time and unmute as well so we can see you. Thank you so much. Awesome. I see Dr. Zubai. Great. Oh, that's a bunch of all that great art. Huh? You're looking good. <laughs> good evening. All right. Uh, Dr. Ed is great, great. So we have all our panelists here. Thank you again for making the time to be here this evening. And we're so ready, right? We're ready to hear from you, to learn from you around these different areas of practice where you specialize. And to everyone else on the call, I just want to note that you know you've heard we've got specialists from psychiatry from general medicine uh got a neurologist and a physiotherapist so if you already have questions in this area please feel free to use the q a box to just put your questions in and even as they answer questions right if something comes to you please we're just going to take questions throughout this session right um so please make sure you do that you can ask questions with your name or anonymously and um, you can also be specific on who you're directing it to. And if you're not sure, you can just say, well, anybody that wants to answer can take it. All right, so I'll get started right now uh, to all our panelists. I think I'm gonna be starting with Dr. Zubair. Mm -hmm. What is, um, and the question is, right, everybody's gonna get to answer this particular question. It is, what is one habit that people have today that is detrimental to their health? especially in your own area of practice, right? And maybe you can start by just giving us a brief overview of what you do as a neurologist. And then uh, from there, you can tell us what is one thing that we're doing wrong in that area. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to have discussion with, with people on health generally, uh, more specifically to my own area of expertise, which is brain health. Um, there are a lot of things we do these days that affect our health, and that also comes down to brain health. Uh, like the earlier speaker actually said, she has defined what health is, is well-being without being absence of any illness. Um, well, I think majorly we'll come to diet first, which is um, our diet is changing. And with changing diets, it predisposes us to so many chronic illnesses. Top of the list is hypertension, which is the commonest disease in our own environment here. And hypertension actually leads to many other complications. In my own area of practice, it's actually stroke. And in the past, we used to think stroke was a disease of the elderly. But these days, it's actually more of a disease of middle age. In my world round of about 20 patients with stroke, you have about 10, 15 people 
that are less than 45. And you wonder that this is a disease when you were training that is more of diseases of, of elderly. And now you have young people coming down with stroke. Unfortunately, stroke kills, but in some moment, many times it doesn't and it deteriorates, and thereby living a very uncomfortable life where you can't live on your own anymore, unfortunately. So to cut it short, apart from diet, the other thing is um, diet comes with food, it comes with alcohol. Alcohol is part of food, and unfortunately, alcohol is another thing that causes, it affects the whole body anyway, from the brain down to the liver, to the kidney, to the mind, and the whole body. And alcohol is one thing that we've, uh, that we've indulged in that affects our health badly. The one close right. to the stroke, uh, is, um, sorry, smoking. And mm. the other thing mainly is the way we walk, and which is, like now we're having a webinar, either everybody's using their phone or using their desktop. And it's really affecting our neck. Thank That's you. the catastrophe that is coming to us very soon, which is cervical spondylosis. Thank you. We can always unpack that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Zubair. And right off the bat, that is already very informative diet. Who knows? <laughs> right. Um, I think I'll go to Dr. Bonvola Biri next. Um, if you could please, um, same question, right? In your own field of practice, what are we doing wrong that is killing us, really? And um, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, your work as well, that would be great. All right. Thank you, Uluwa Um Well, so the work that I do as a psychiatrist uh, is to largely treat, identify, and manage, you know, uh, patients or clients with um, difficult life events, traumatic experiences, who may or may not break down in such a way that, um, you know, their life becomes extremely distressing to them, and they find it difficult to function, either, you know, enjoying their own life by themselves, quality of life drops, they don't enjoy relationships. They don't enjoy interactions. They're not able to work fruitfully or contribute their quota to the environment that they live in. So that's the work that I do. Um, aside that, of course, I also do a lot of uh, social media advocacy on getting the word out there in a bid to reduce the stigma, discrimination, and ignorance that is associated with mental health conditions. And so what is one thing? What is the one thing that we're all doing wrong? It's the fact that um, we we don't give our uh, mental health the attention that it deserves. And so more often than not, if I asked everyone on this call now, how many of us have mental health? And I left us to respond. How many of us have mental health? If you have mental health, say yes. If you don't have mental health, say no. Chances are you'd have quite a number of people deciding to sit on the fence. More often than not, because when people hear the word mental, they're thinking yaba left, they're thinking arrow, they're thinking the young man or woman that is disheveled, unkempt, sitting on, you know, or walking around naked on the streets. And so we, we deny it, we prevent it, we reject it by whatever it is that we can to say that, oh, no, I don't have mental health. No, I don't have mental illness. It is not part of me or my family members. But the honest truth is for everyone on this call, for every human being alive and, you know, well, as long as you have a brain, you can have a mental health condition. You can have a mental illness, you can have a mental disorder. And so until people come to that realization that it can be anybody. And so usually, you know, when people say, if you be you, people are always thinking it's always something good. But, right. you know, bad things can also happen if we don't take care of our health. And so neglecting our mental health and not giving it the attention that it deserves, I believe that that's the one thing that people are not doing quite well. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Wow. There's really already a lot there, you know, I've not even gotten into it really. Thank you for that great um, one. I'll go to Dr. Awoshika next. Um, good evening, ma'am, and welcome. Um, so if you could tell us, what is that one thing? Again, same question, and also a little bit about the work that you do. Okay. Hello, everybody. All right. So it's nice to be here. Um, as a physiotherapist, over the years, what I have observed that people fail to do is to actually exercise. Um, we feel going to work every morning, every day, you know, you're getting active. Okay, I'm driving, I'm doing this and that makes you active. So you think you're fit. But actually, the truth is, uh, we live a sedimentary lifestyle. You know, sitting in the office over the years and um, for long hours, 
just on the table and chair on the computer on the system working so all this of um this has a way of um making us feel that oh we are physically active however we are not physically active we are not fit because we are actually supposed to exercise you know exercise is the kind of physical activity that is done you know appropriately in order to achieve an aim that is to make us fit so i think what generally what we are not getting well is to exercise and um, engage ourselves in some physical activities to make us fit generally. And that's what results to all this issue of hypertension, people having diabetes and all that. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Shika. Exercise, I'm definitely guilty, God help us. <laughs> all right, Dr. Ede, um, now over to you. You could please okay. introduce yourself. And, um, yes. All right. So my name is my, my name is um, Dr. Ed Egmini Omokudu. I just call me Ed for short. Um, so pretty much uh, what I do, I'm the head of the preventives and wellness um, department at AXA Mansard Health. Um, so pretty much I manage all the preventive efforts um, in terms of what managing your COVID, managing your gyms, uh, managing your annual health screenings, you know, both home and abroad. Pretty much um, that's um, what I do. Um, for accidents and, and for other external clients as well. Um, in terms of what I think is wrong, is pretty much I would say almost everything, right? Um, the way I, I I look at the world through a lens, um, it may call me a bit scientific, but it's called mass, energy, space, and time. It's just basically for a quadrant. Um, I have a quad view of everything, and mass in terms of exactly what our body does, and um, in terms of what we what we do. So I'll tell you. I'll start with the general uh, overview. Well, just as the physiotherapist said, we're sitting too much, right? Um, sitting is the new smoking, as they say, right? So, I mean, and it's so pervasive, right? Whenever you think about it in every single facet, think about it, wake up in the morning, you want to sit down, you pray, right? You sit down to pray. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you go and sit down and do number two, right? You get up, you go downstairs, you sit down, you have breakfast. You get there, you sit down in your car, right? From your car or in the bus, and then you get to the hospital, you know, the office and whatever. Hey, what's up, BNP? What's up, everybody? And then you sit down on your desk again for the how many hours? Then how many of us even say, you know what? I don't need to sit down too much self. Okay. Uh, do I stand to eat lunch? How many of us stand to eat lunch? Not all of us will sit down again. And then when we're done, we're going to sit down. And when we're back home in the evening, I'm too tired and short. I just want to watch Netflix and chill. Well, let's sit down again. So you see how that has, as I have, you know, um, from a general standpoint, um, it's, it's popular knowledge, by the way, um, that within the first 10 minutes, I mean, look at what we've been on this call now, 10 minutes, right? More than 10 minutes. Within the first 10 minutes of sitting, our metabolism has actually plummeted by, in terms of its efficiency, by as much as 70%. 10 minutes. Let that sink in. So imagine what happens over the course of eight hours. So we're actually, it's going like in the red. So that's the first, from a physical standpoint. So from the general overview, it's a general practitioner myself. Um, physically, that's the mass part of thing. Um, in terms of the mental health, Dr. Bondra has already spoken about everything in terms of how we think. And your know, mental, I, I love the way she put it because she's not. She, she was talking about not just about the state. So whenever you look at the mental space, um, health space, you think about it um, as you know as a fixed state and as a dynamic state as well. So as a fixed state is what we're thinking, and then from the dynamic state is how we are thinking. So it's about what we're thinking. And then about the psychology behind how we are thinking. So again, um, she has spoken about that, and I love how she put it. So that's just really just how how it is. Um, so again, it's everything. Um, for mass and time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. That was that was great. I mean, and we can all see what we can do better. Obviously. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for answering our one question about diets. We need to do better with that. Uh, we need to also take care of our mental health. We need to give it some more attention. We need to exercise, right? And not sit too much, right? Those are really great things that we can already start to see how we can improve on as we continue this conversation. I'm gonna hand over to your first now to take us through the first round of questions. Thank you. All right, uh, it was so great sitting through and listening to all the panelists, good insights. Um, just here, just to get Dr. where they talk about um, sitting down and resuming metabolism, I think I need to stand up. With it. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Um, and then <laughs> get my metabolism up. So wherever you are, maybe you want to try that. 
Yeah, but just quickly going to it now, I think we're out of time. Um, first question, I think I will go to you, Dr. Abiri, yeah, about mental health. You talked about how you raise awareness for mental health. Can you tell us a little bit more about what mental health really is and how do I know if I have a mental health problem? Do I need to wait when people are looking at me somehow and be like, okay, it seems I'm mad. Or what are the signs to know if I have a mental health problem? Over to you. All right, so I'll start with that language that you just used. It seems I'm mad. <laughs> what, what, the conversation is going to, um, we need to change the language. You understand what I mean? So that we can make people comfortable enough to say that this is what's going on with me and I want to talk to somebody about it. Um, mental health. Health, again, you know, like I've been described previously, is not just the absence of disease or infirmity. It's not, I don't have cough, I don't have cut, I haven't been to the hospital for the past 10 years, praise God with me. It's a completeness, a complete state. However, when you speak about it to mental, mental connotes the mind. The functions of the mind are the functions of thought, emotion, cognition, behavior, perception. And so once we say that an individual is mentally healthy, it means that all of these things are working quite well. They are successfully functioning in such a way that that individual is able to achieve four major things. One, cope with the normal stresses of life. Two, contribute their own quota to the environment that they live in. Three, engage in productive activities. And four, have thriving relationships. If an individual is able to do all of these things, we say that the individual is mentally healthy. There was something that Dr. Um, Ede had said earlier on about how it is that nobody actually has it all. Mental health and mental illness is actually a continuum. And so at every point in time, we are either swinging towards health or swinging towards illness. It is our lifestyle, the things that we do, how we do it, when we do it, that will tilt us in either directions. Now, how can I tell if I have a mental illness? You know, when HIV came to town many years ago, you know what they said to us? They said, you know, they show for face. <laughs> and so many times you may not know. You may never know. The individual who has the illness may even be the last person to know. And I say this because quite a number of times, the organ that is affected when someone has a mental illness is the brain. When the brain is sick, how does it tell itself that it is sick? And so the individual may never know. And so the responsibility is on a lot of people, loved ones, family, friends, co-workers, who notice that there's a deviation from the norm. Oh, a fossa will come into work smiling, chilling. When he comes into the room, the, the old room comes alive. But for the past couple of days, whenever a fossa comes in, he just goes to his corner and sits down. There's something going on. And so it may be changes in mood, changes in emotion, changes in how the individual talks, what they say. It may be problems with sleep, problems with appetite problems with sexual issues. It may be the fact that the individual is beginning to have you know, unusual thoughts, unusual beliefs, believing that somebody wants to kill them, somebody is after them. And it gets to a point where these thoughts become uncontrollable. Of course, at the end of the day, all of these things will cause significant distress to the individual in such a way that it affects their functioning with themselves, with others, with the environment, and with the work it is that they do. This is how you can know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abiri, for, for that. I, I now know a lot better about what mental health is and, and how I know. We'll come back to you uh, quickly about that. But um, moving on to Dr. Mokodo, um, for, for some kind of roles or kind of jobs, right, people tend to have to depend on painkillers, uh, sleeping pills, and all that a lot. How much of that is, is too much, right? How much of those sleeping pills is too much? And are there some side effects of those that we should be mindful of? Yes, to be honest, um, it's, it's a, that's an interesting question because you know how we me measure dosage, right? In medicine, it's weird. It's basically how many milligrams, you know, per kilogram body weight and all those. So it's plenty, 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 plenty calculation. Do you understand? I can't come and tell you, oh, go and take 500 milligrams of this. You'll be shocked that some kids, because of the fact that they are on the big side, plus size, you give them adult dosage, even though they're kids. Why? Because their body has to cater to all of that. So again, the kilogram per body weight kind of thing really adds up in terms of dosage. However, again, being a preventive um, person, right? I always say prevention is better than cure. That's how we always say it. So the best thing is to look at in terms of 
um, you know, uh, sleeping pills and whatnot. Sleep itself, no matter how much you take medication or pills or anything, that has, that's, you're just treating the symptom. You're still not dealing with the root cause, right? So no matter what the way you read it, this guy is, is still there. Do you understand? And it will still keep, you know, Yoruba Prophet says, it's still there. So that's the major thing that is still causing. So no matter how much you treat the symptoms, it's still going to be doing what it wants to do. And it's doing it even much worse. So yeah, it, the condition is getting worse, right? So in terms of sleep, one of the things you want to do is how do you manage this? As a matter of fact, we have a, a talk on sleep that we, we, we normally give some of our clients. Sleep is a science. It's an art form. It's something that is, I think there's no greater health policy on the planet than sleep, right? So is how to understand sleep in its entirety and then how you can now deal with it. There's certain tips I'll share. So you want to sleep better. Uh, one of the first things I'll tell you is uh, that we are all guilty of is caffeine, right? So when you come to the office, you take tea, you take your, your coffee, and then you drink plenty. Oh, I don't like my coffee, whatever. I like it black, right? So the first thing to understand about coffee is that, you know, caffeine has a half-life. So the half-life of caffeine it's about six hours. So let's say you come to office, you take your, 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 your coffee and biscuit and whatever around 10. By five in the evening, right? Half of that caffeine is still swimming in your brain. By 10, a quarter of that caffeine is still swimming in your brain, right? By 5 a.m. So between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., you're still having some caffeine still swimming. So there's no how it would affect the quality of your sleep. And I'll have you know that, um, you know, um, sleep itself, especially in young men, if we have punctuations or disturbances in our deep REM sleep patterns, right? Um, there's been an increased incidence of lung cancer in such men. That's just for one. So that's something you want, uh, you, you want to be mindful of. Um, another tip for those who may have issues sleeping rather than just taking the medication. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm rambling a bit because again, I'm going back to preventive healthcare and natural, not drug induced kind of stuff. Because a lot of times, if you've noticed across the board, a lot of people are having kidney issues, kidney um, disease issues now. Why? From certain medications, right? That could also be affecting the, the kidneys themselves. So medications in terms of quality control in these parts has not been properly checked. So you're going to have acute kidney um, you know, injury as well. So which is why I'm trying to help you with in terms of you know more preventive tips. So I won't ramble on for too long. I'll give you two more tips to help with your sleep. And then second one is take a hot shower. It's weird right normally you say i oh, mean take a cold shower when i when i take a cold shower i feel so cool and i feel so whatever right and that's one way but strong the body the way the, the body was designed right is in such a way that it it maintains a temperature around a certain range so if you take a cold shower that means all the warmth that is around you is going to try and get that one and concentrate that at your core you won't be able to lose as much so later in the night you realize that after showering in a hot night on a hot night after showering cold water later in the night you get up and you shower again right if, if i'm right you can actually put that in the chat right but then you find that if you take a hot shower the way to trick the body is reverse engineer the entire process you take a hot shower you increase the body's temperature to a high degree and the body in its in its panicking state of trying to expel all that heat it will take it to like it will overshoot the amount of heat it expels to the point that you have very small heat left at your core. You realize you're cooler for the entirety of the night. So that's another way to do that. Um, another one is to well, reduce your, your amount of light that you have. You were talking about sleep medication as well, uh, um, you know, or painkillers. Painkillers too. Um, you know, sorry to I'll, I'll speak to more of the social side of things. In in Nigeria, a lot of our young men or young people take this abu, this drink, all these ones that say um, alabu, always carry it up and down the place, right? So they yeah. come, carry that. So uh, you know, and you know what they mix inside? They mix lots of aspirin. They mix it with panadol inside. So there was a comedian that said something. Was, I think it was Cat Williams. He said, you know, I asked my brother if you take 20, 20 um, you know, um, pills of uh, tablets of um, uh, what do you call it of panadol, what happens to you? He can't even answer. He said that would be your last headache, right? <laughs> so at the end of the day, right? So think about it. That's one of the things that's causing a lot of kidney issues, right? The, the abuse of painkillers, right? And because they're so readily available, right? They affect the kidney, affect the liver, affect all those things. Um, you know, so those are another thing. So you want to minimize uh, certain kind of medication. So um, um, for sleeping in the night, just going back to that last um, tip, 
um, sleeping at night, reduce the amount of light um, sources you have in your house. Um, that will also help as well. So thank you so much for that. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mokodu. Uh, that was very enlightening. I'm sure uh, we can sleep better now, no uh, rely on sleeping pills. So I'll move over to you, Dr. Zubair. Um, as a neurologist, right, uh, what are the common ailments that require me to come see a neurologist? What, what do I need to see for me to walk up to a neurologist uh, for consultation? Thank you. Um, well, a neurologist is a medical doctor that takes care of diseases of the central nervous system, meaning the brain and the spine and the associated nerves around it. Now, the commonest disease that most people tend to see a neurologist for in these environments, and basically worldwide, is headache. I think it's the commonest. Close to that is epilepsy or seizures, which is also very common. Most people are epileptic and don't know. The next to that is stroke, which has become a kind of disease of, of, the, of the third world now because 70% of strokes actually happen in third world countries now. The change of diet, like I said, our lifestyle, lack of exercise, which has predisposed us more to hypertension, which leads to stroke. The other one that is becoming a pandemic is degenerative spine, meaning cervical spondylosis or lumbar spondylosis, meaning layman's word, neck pain and back pain. I think we have talked a little about that. Our way of life has really predisposed us to this kind of disease. Using the phone, I'm sure nobody carries his phone and look at his phone up. Everybody bends the neck to look at the phone. And that has kept us, people that stay so long on social media, people that are always on their decks working, their back sitting position has predisposed us. And it's going to be the, the disease of the next century or the next decade because is becoming very rampant. In the past, you tend to see, like I said again, it, te it tends to be a disease of the old age. But now you see a 16 year old coming with neck pain. And some of them presenting with headache anyway, and it's the job, the way they do their job, the way they do their things that led them to that. Next to this is movement disorders. You have, you have people with Parkinson's disease, then, um, the next to that is peripheral neuropathy, whereby people have different kind of pains on the legs and on the hands. So basically, the commonest worldwide is headaches, and um, everybody thinks you see patients that say, "No, I have this kind of headache, damn normal headache," and I wonder which one is a normal headache. There is never a normal headache. There is nothing like a normal headache. A headache is a head pain associated with it because of the nerve endings to the brain and to so other tissues around the brain that around the the brain itself doesn't give pain. It's tissues or nerves connecting to the brain or the vessels that actually give headache. So headache is the commonest. The next is epilepsy. And at any talk I give, I try to tell people about epilepsy. It's a disease that, has, that goes unnoticed because everybody believes epilepsy is just about conversion. Is more than conversion. Conversion is just one of the manifestations of epilepsy, whereby you have jacking of the legs and of the hands, and you have, then the person tends to bite his tongue. That is just one aspect of epilepsy, which is not the common one. The uncommon ones are the ones that, okay, basically epilepsy is just, the brain is a, is a network of wires. And when there's a spark in the brain, that part of the brain, that part the brain controls, functions abnormally. So epilepsy can just be, you having tingling sensation on your hand lasting a few seconds. Or you, the commonest, which I believe gets to the psychiatrist most time is abnormal behavior. And everybody thinks the person has mental illness. And most times it's actually epilepsy. I've had a child that beats a teacher in class and everybody thought he was just, she was just, she just has, because people think it's a spiritual problem. That's the first thing we think. And I, I, the, the child was brought to me and I told him this patient has epilepsy. The first thing is, God forbid, it's not my portion. That's the first thing that comes to it. Unfortunately, the girl had the same, she continued having the seizures for a long time until she had the one that everybody knows as convulsion. That was when they now knew, but it was almost too late at that point because she should have gotten treatment. There was stigmatization already. There are so many things that comes with it. 
So there are so many diseases you see in neurologists. So I think the common question most people actually ask is what's the difference between a neurologist and a neurosurgeon? There is, there, is, there is actually a difference. We treat brain diseases and spine diseases. They operate diseases of the spine and brain that needs to take out something. So well, we work together. So basically, like I said, the common diseases we see, and for this generation, stroke is one thing we shouldn't also forget. It's a very common thing and is on the rise because of our lifestyle again. Basically, our diet, our, our food, and the kind of things we do, our way of life that has led us to diabetes and hypertension. I think I'm, the last thing I want to talk about is drug abuse, which I think the psychiatrist will also talk about. It's another thing that I think Dr. Mokodo has said a little thing about painkillers and people abusing sleep, sleep drugs. The other thing that is a major problem is drug abuse. Everybody takes one drug or the other, just for one thing or the other, and not treating the cause of the problem and just keeping it on for too long. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Zubar. I think if we have some more time, we're going to unpack the headache thing because I see that's a part of the major issue we are seeing around uh, lots of headache, migraines that are not ending. But we'll move on to you, Dr. Awoshita. Uh, we, you mentioned you are, you know, you are a physiotherapist. But typically, when people hear physiotherapy, they think uh, it's when I have maybe an accident or a broken bone. Maybe that's when I need to see a physiotherapist, right? Um, what is what is the scope of physiotherapy really, and what are the problems I have that will make me see a physiotherapist? All right, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to briefly talk about what physiotherapy is all about. Um, we call it physiotherapy here, the, uh, the Americans call it physical therapy, and it's actually a health profession that is concerned with um, restoring, maintaining of body movement and function of an individual that has sustained an injury or disabilities. And the type of conditions, we see all category of health conditions. But this can be grouped into um, like orthopedic conditions, the conditions that affect um, your neck, your back. Like the neurologist said, that the new disease now is a degenerative disease affecting the neck, the back, uh, people having knee pains and all that, um, issues of sports injuries, that those that are into sports. And um, also, neurological conditions, not like stroke. That is the complication from high blood pressure, um, Parkinson's disease and all that. Um, also in women's health, physiotherapy plays a major role in women's health, especially um, in the cases of uh, incontinence. You see some women after childbirth, they'll tell you, oh, anytime I sneeze, I can't control my urine, I pee on my pants and all that, and it's embarrassing. So we come in in that aspect. Some also have uh, postpartum pain, you know, due to maybe prolonged labor and all that, you know, we play a major role in, all, in that also. Also in the aspect of children, pediatrics, there's some neurological conditions that uh, we physiotherapists also manage, like um, the issue of um, uh, this common one, cerebral palsy. That when, when the mother will bring the baby to the hospital and say, oh, the, this baby is three months, the baby is not yet sitting, uh, the baby's head control is very poor and all of that. That's cerebral palsy. And we physiotherapists, actually drugs or medication won't actually manage that. That's when physiotherapy comes in, when we manage this category of patients. And also on the aspect of general health and rehabilitation, like stroke cases, which involves paralysis of either the legs, the hand, and all that. Physiotherapy actually manages all this type of condition. So I would rather say that physiotherapy is all encompassing. We manage all variety of conditions that medication cannot actually take care of. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Awosika. Um, thank you, all, all the panelists. Um, please. For our participants, please feel free to drop your question that you have in the chat box, and I will also take your questions. So I'll hand over now back to Bukola to take the next round of questions. Over to you, Bukola. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Of course, sir. 
Yes, um, a lot to learn. I've been writing nonstop since all the panelists started answering the questions. Thank you so much. A lot of wisdom. And I see that people in the chat are concurring as well. Who knew that odd bath was the thing, right? Uh, thank you Dr. Day, for that. That's definitely one that we're all going to start a practice from right now. <laughs> Okay, um, I see a question, um, if I have just reminded us uh, to please drop our questions, but I see a question from Thelma Oria Day, and uh, this is for Dr. Bonjabola Abiri. Um, she wants to know the difference between psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists. Is there a difference between all three? Can one person be all three? Could you just shed a little light on that? All right. Thank you very much for the question. And um, I think that question is apt in, you know, in this day and age where everybody is a quote and unquote therapist, especially when uh, mental health has become such a buzzword. And so um, a therapist is actually a licensed professional. So I mean, abroad, if you were in America or in the UK, you're more likely to hear that people say that they're going to see a therapist and that therapist could be a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a licensed professional counselor, a licensed social worker, you know, who provides such services. However, these individuals have master's degrees and they have approval of their licensing boards to practice in the mental health field. And so what they do largely is that they provide a diagnosis for the mental health condition and also develop a treatment plan. They can either work in offices, you know, hospitals, you know, in sports places, group homes, and they do a wide range, you know, of therapy that is geared towards mental health care. Therapists, however, cannot recommend or prescribe medications, but they can refer you to individuals who will be able to do that. Now let's move on to who a psychologist is. And a psychologist is an individual who, whose specialty is largely on, you know, behavior and mental processes. So they look at, you know, emotional processes, cognitive processes, how people interact with their environments and how they interact with other people. Psychologists usually would have a BSc, a Bachelor of Science, first of all, in, in psychology. However, the ones that then go ahead to, you know, practice with, you know, mental health conditions, go ahead to do a master's in clinical psychology. And if they want to go ahead, they can go ahead to have a PhD in psychology, which will then, you know, enable them to be called doctors of psychology. So that's the difference. They use what is known as talk therapy, psychotherapy or talk therapy. They use highly specialized talk therapies and they are very much trained in this area. So you can have a um, psychologist who is trained in trauma, family therapy, couples therapy, death, or how it is that individuals can manage grief. And so the last but not the least, which I am, is a psychiatrist. And so first of all, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor, a medical doctor who has decided that they want to do a specialty in that training that is called psychiatry. And so after you know, becoming a doctor, NYC house job, you then go for a residency training program in psychiatry, which can take between four years to you know, plus X. And that's not dependent on us, that's just dependent on how, you know, how soon you are able to get it done. And so you can do it in four years, sometimes people do it in 10. And so, after, yeah, after, you know, becoming a psychiatrist, what then happens is you have become extremely knowledgeable in not just your aspect of medicine, but in psychology, you know a bit about, you know, a bit about everything and, and you're a fully grounded and fully knowledgeable individual. The psychiatrist is able to identify, treat, write out um, treatment plans. The psychiatrist is able to, you know, prescribe medications. And if it is a psychiatrist who has interest in psychotherapy, which is professional talk therapy, that psychiatrist can also, you know, combine the work of a clinical psychologist. Well, because of course it's extremely cumbersome and the ratio of uh, psychiatrists to the population. I mean, if, if you're saying one doctor to 9,000 patients <laughs> for psychiatrists, it is one psychiatrist to a million people in Nigeria at yeah. present. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I'm sure Thelma has gotten a lot of um, more light, you know, in, in understanding the difference between those three professions. Thank you. Uh, Tony, you have your hand raised um, before we continue. <laughs> okay, maybe that was a mistake. Uh, we'll, just, uh, we'll just go on. 
Right. Uh, we've got some more questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the Q&A box, rather. Um, and I see that Dr. Ede has, um, um, he said you would like to answer one of that um, live. So we have a question on obesity. If obesity can be cured. Um, Dr. Ede, over to you, please. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so obesity can be cured. Um, you know, Bukula, thank you so much. Um, it, obesity can be cured. What's obesity really? Is that your BMI, your body mass index is beyond a certain threshold. So you fall within a certain, you know, um, and threshold. Now the thing about BMIs though is that um, um, the BMI is basically states that once you reach a certain threshold from 30, BMI from 30 and up, you are considered obese. However, the values can be skewed depending on the structure of the person if the person is tall and has big really big bones like tyson fury the type of um height right or even let's say deontay wilder the bmi will tell you that he's something else so it doesn't really take account but for people who are more of average heights from like six and down right the bmi is very very accurate you have other things you can check like trunkal obesity you know amount of fat you have around your waist and hip region and all of those things those are things to check but can obesity be cured yeah short answer yes yes what you have to do is that you have to lose weight. That's it. So now one of the ways I always try to you know, tell people is that personally, what is your why? What's your fitness? First, what's your fitness goal? What do you want to be like? I mean, I've had, when I was, you know, before my, 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 my wedding, I was a bit on the big side. And so for my wedding, I'm from Edo State. So my wedding, when I lost weight, I got my six pack, everything. I didn't wear shit. She understand. And I just beads beads and, and so it, it's weird because you know after getting married to you know my wife is half evil half evil so now you know or has to don't wound person and all those things don't want it. so in my mind i'm like okay i told her you know for our anniversary is in july that was in july that i'll give her you know six pack i've given her you know so far not two pack i don't i don't lose i took only four so hopefully by december right i'm going to get that so what's the difference is that you have a fitness goal so my fitness goal is to get that six pack have a body mass index or or, or, a, or fat you know um distribution is kind of, so what is it that you want to attain it doesn't have to be if you want to be super ripped you know that's what you're going for then you ask yourself how do i get there okay um first know that it's a journey and you just have to do it small at a time the best thing in terms of weight loss no matter what it is is consistency and progress just do something every single day about what's even if you don't do if it's one push-up you do today you know that you've done one push-up at least just do something mm. towards that goal and you will right. always get something so have your fitness goal have a battle plan um try to stay disciplined it really really help you to do that thank you thank you dr Eder. so i mean it's clear obesity can be cured fitness goal a plan a plan to stay active and do it once they're part of time Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Zubai actually has quite a number of questions. There are people who are very curious about your field of practice. And I would just uh, try to maybe put some of the questions together and then you can um, help us unpack them. Uh, the first is from Topware Fortune. Uh, this person is asking, how does neurogenesis work? And how can we employ it in our workplace? I, I believe it will, some of us would also like to know what that is to even start with. And then I uh, would like to know how it works. And um, there's another one from an anonymous attendee that says, what are the healthy practices to imbibe so as to avoid stroke, epilepsy, and some of the other illnesses you have described? Over to you, sir. Okay, I'll start with the first one which is the um, neurogenesis, where neurogenesis is just the formation of new neurons. Um, basically, this is done during embryonic stage. That is early life. That's the general belief. But there is a new school of thoughts that says even in adult life, new neurons are formed. But that is not effective enough to do so much. The new concept really is neuroplasticity whereby some cells there dies and the, the other cells that are dead takes over the functions of the ones that are dead. So neuroplasticity, yes, but neurogenesis is not a concept that is fully understood yet and is not, is not helping any disease presently. People talk about neurostem cells, which have been used in some diseases like Parkinson's, but they are still in the early stages of development. So in the workplace, neurogenesis might not really do much for most people in the workplace. 
But neuroplasticity, like I said, is whereby you have neurons taking over the functions of other cells that are dead. So that is the area of science that we are actually putting so much effort into, especially in the areas of stroke and other neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so neurogen neurogenesis is more for when you are less than two years and the new neurons are actually forming. And that's why we, take, we say children should be fed well at that age and they should be exposed to so much social environment for the development of the brain at that age. Maybe that development is not so fantastic after the age of two and three. Most other things that happen are just neuroplasticity. So I think that I hope that answers that question. Now, the second question is about um, if I, how to prevent stroke. Well, stroke, really, I mean, science and in medicine, most times, sometimes you can't say this actually causes this, but we know what we talk about risk factor. Risk factor is something that most people is a bit difficult for people to understand. But the truth is that when we see something, you have a risk, that means the chances of you having that disease is higher. That means if you are hypertensive, the chances of you having a stroke compared to someone that is not hypertensive is almost seven folds or more. So when we talk about stroke, we talk about modifiable risk factors, which is the area where you can do something about. Those are things you can change around your environment to prevent you from coming down with stroke. And we have what you can modify. You can modify your gender. You can modify your age. You can bring that down your age. No matter how much you change it, your change tends to increase. And you can't, you can't change your race. No matter how much you bleach, you are still black, you are black. So those things you can't change. But there are things you can change. You can change hypertension. You can't prevent hypertension from happening. The truth is that we are black. With time, you are going to be hypertensive. If you take salt, it's a question of time. If you live long enough, your blood pressure is going to rise. So what are those things you do? One is you have to reduce your salt intake. If you don't take a salt at all, the chances of you being hypertensive is almost negligible. The other thing is that you exercise regularly. For exercise, medical exercise for preventing diabetes and hypertension has to be emphasized that it has to be pleasurable. If you are doing an exercise that is not pleasurable, then it's not medical exercise as far as I'm concerned. You have to sweat out the salt. It has to be regular. Minimum of every other day, three to four times a week. It has to be minimum of at least 25 to 30, 40 minutes. Those are the things, but most importantly, it must be pleasurable. If it's not pleasurable, then there's a thin line between exercise and stress. Now, in all these, I've not said you have to jog, you have to run, but you have to do things that will make you sweat. And it has to be pleasurable. It has to be constant for you to have the effect. So that is one thing. Diabetes is another area where you have to talk about your diet, you have to reduce your food, you have to avoid. Yes, people talk about losing weight and eating twice a day. It doesn't work for diabetes. It's even better you eat more, but in small, in small, in small aliquots so that you present food to your body at a little time, not plenty. Because if you take too plenty, then you store more and you increase your size. Then you put more efforts to your body to metabolize that. I, do, I shouldn't forget smoking is another risk factor. Checking your heart is important. We've had many young people that you went to play football, you went on a walk and you dropped, you dropped dead. Heart disease is one thing that doesn't tell you is there. You have to always come and check. You have to, because if you have a heart disease, the chances of your stroke is three times higher than people without heart disease. The other thing is alcohol. Now, there is this trick about alcohol, which is very difficult to analyze. It is that we tell you reduce, because some people will say little alcohol is good. The truth is that it's dynamic. Everybody refers to a study, and it depends on how you interpret that study. The study says people that didn't take alcohol, people that took little alcohol, and people that took a lot of alcohol. People that took a lot of alcohol have more cardiovascular deaths, that is stroke, heart attack. People that had little, had better chances than people that did not take. That's what the study said. But coming down five years down the lane, people that were taking little had gone to more. And in that, in that respect, they are now in the group of people that are likely going to have so we try to tell you stop alcohol, but we say reduce because if you reduce now, then the chances that you reduce later, you continue to reduce it there. So alcohol is another important thing. The other ones I think we've talked about physical inability. We tend to sit down too much. We don't move around. We don't exercise. That is that. And um, um, I think those are the major things about Thank stroke. You.
about. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Zuzwa. That was very, very informative. And I hope that um, the anonymous attendee and also uh, Top of Fortune have been educated by that as we all. Um, I think one thing I just want to emphasize and something you said is the importance of those checkups, right? Um, it's somewhat mandated for us here to do it at least one time a year, uh, but I think it's important that we even, you know, add it to our routine, you know, uh, maybe more than once a year. Okay, so um, I have a question now, you know, you, you, the, your last point Dr. Zubai was around, you know, the fact that we see too much. We're just not active enough. And uh, Dr. Oshikan, this next question is for you. Uh, we're seeing a lot of us, because I mean, that club as well, who are coming up with back aches, right? Neck pain. It's just, well, if I was some of us that are like, oh my gosh, I need my back to have a baby, right? Do it differently, right? To so start to improve that. Just can you take question again? I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. Yes. So the question is um, is uh, that we tend to. Can you hear me now? Yeah, come again. Your network is uh, fluctuating. Oh, apologies. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I said with the frequent that young people tend to have today, are their lifestyle changes, right? What can we start to do differently to, to heal from the pain that we experience? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, all the back pain, neck pain that we actually experience is due to our posture the type of posture we adopt when we're doing an activity. And some of us are very fond of adopting very funny posture. Posture is the way you position your body to carry out a task. And um, over time, when we subject um, our body to a poor posture, it uh, weakens our muscles, it weakens our muscles, causes stiffness and all that, thereby overworking the spine. So on the long run, you, you see yourself coming down with a back pain, stiff neck, neck pain, and all that. So first of all, to, for us to avoid all these kind of pains is to always adopt a good posture. And number one is workplace ergonomics. Because the truth is we spend most of our time in the office, on the, doing desk work, on the computer, on our phones, and all that. So it's actually very important, to, uh, important for us to adopt proper posture. And how do we achieve that? Um, always try to sit upright in your chair. Um, I, can we, I, are you guys listening? Yeah, sitting upright on our chair with our back well supported um, on the backrest of a chair. And also, um, especially now that most of us, we use our tabs, our phones to send emails, you know, for, to, uh, to do our normal daily activities. We also always advise us to always try to lift our phones or our laptop to a high level as much as possible. We, when we do that, we, we avoid excessive um, bending of the neck, which on the long run causes us to come down with back pain and neck pain. Then also, because of the kind of work we do, which to me is more of a signature lifestyle, we sing, we sit down for a long time. So we also had rights that um, you avoid sitting for a long time. Like after sitting for like 30, 40 minutes, you should always have a break, like five minutes break, leg stretch and all that. You know, this is for your muscle to actually relax. You take a walk for five, seven minutes within your office. You don't necessarily need to go out of your office to do that. You can do it within your office, take a stroll to your friend, have some chats and go back to your work. You know, with that, we're able to break that long sitting position we adopt when we are in the office. Then also um, our ergonomics, workplace ergonomics, you know, the type of chairs and tables we use in the office. There are some offices that the chairs are very terrible, but there are some chairs we call ergonomic chairs. Those are chairs that have been designed to support our back properly. 
So it's very important for offices or your office to also invest in that, you know, to generally improve the health and awareness of the staff. Then also, um, the I'm still on posture, um, our sleeping positions at home, you know, some of us, our mattress are actually potholes, like the potholes on the street. You know, when you sleep, by the time you wake up in the morning, you can see large parts of the uh, mattress, you know, has gone inside and all that. And you can be any witness that when you wake up from those kind of bed, you wake up with some cramps on your low back and all that. So it's very important to have a very good type of mattress and pillow. Um, there are some semi-orthopedic mattress there, you know, those kind of, you know, takes the contour of your body when you lie down on them. So those are those basic things that we need to do that could prevent us from having all these pains and aches that we mm -hmm. have. Then generally exercise, like I said, exercise is very important because um, it improves our wellness. It improves our fitness. It strengthens our muscles. You know, it makes us fit generally. And as Dr. Zubair have said earlier on, you know, it's very important we exercise at least 30 to 40 minutes, alternate days is very important. This helps you to keep fit, makes your muscles fit and you know, so it's, you, you don't have the problem of coming down with some aches and pains because of some activities. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Malik. I kept trying to adjust my posture as you were talking and just, you know, to quickly start to, but, but thank you. We will definitely um, note those ones. And thank you, Dr. Eddie. I see that you've responded to one of the questions um, in the Q&A box. Um, there's another important issue we want to quickly ask about um, is the issue of drug abuse. And, and this is for you, Dr. Guajibola, um, around, you know, what exactly is drug abuse? I'm sure we all have an idea, but I, I'm sure that there's probably a clinical perspective that we don't know anything about that you can enlighten us on. And uh, what are the physical signs, right, of um, abuse of, of um, someone who is maybe abusing drug, what can we notice as people who are looking from the outside and maybe even from the person, right? You know, is there a point that maybe the person should check it, right? Uh, and I know you probably touched on this a little earlier, but maybe you could just shed more light. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. I feel like that's a, that this conversation would not have been, you know, complete without talking about substance. Um, so, you know, a drug is a chemical substance which, when ingested in the body, causes, you know, certain chemical changes, sometimes chemical, physiological changes, and all of that in the body. And drugs can be categorized into um, two, licit and illicit. So, you know, um, the ones that are good for use or fit for use and the ones that pretty much like street drugs, so to say. Um, we often refer to them as substance. And so a substance can also be put in that category of a drug. Um, when you say illicit substances, so you can put um, cigarettes, you know, alcohol, and maybe prescription medications on that illicit. However, illicit would include things like, you know, marijuana in, you know, its, in, its entirety of, is it SK, is it Black Mamba, is it Kush, is it, uh, you know, to mention just a few. And of course, you'd be talking about uh, cocaine, amphetamines, MDMA, molly. We know, people know them. All of these things are available and they're available in Nigeria. And so when you say that an individual is abusing a drug, it just means the individual is using the drug in a way that it is not supposed to be used. And so very often that, you know, that definition had come when we're talking about prescription medication. And so for instance, people, you know, buy, um, or people go to the doctor. And I'll, I'll give you the practical examples that come to me. Um, an individual goes to the doctor to have a breast job, a stomach job, and a box job. And, you know, in the course of all of those things, to manage the pain, the doctor then gives an injection. And the patient feels a rush, a high, and the patient says, what is that injection? And unfortunately, the doctor or the nurse just says, it. oh, this is what it is. And from that day, that patient becomes a doctor. Not because they had any prior knowledge of injection or anything, but because they want to keep getting that high. It would have surprise you, and maybe it might not, that quite a number of people are able to access drugs that even doctors cannot access. They would pay so much money to get those drugs. I have patients who have ulcers all over their bodies because they're injecting. I have patients whose muscles are, you know, shrinking because they're injecting, you know, 
prescription medication in a way that they're not supposed to you know inject and so people can abuse prescription medication it can be oral medication things like you know tramadol valium if not the date rape drug people can abuse you know um, injections opiates and you know um, it's said that in america there's an opiate pan there's an opiate pandemic or an e endemic in nigeria we have that as well we have an epidemic we have a crisis but we just haven't agreed that we have that crisis because people are not coming out to say that, oh, this person died of an, over, over an overdose. I know patients who have died of an overdose. I know people who have been on the verge of dying of an overdose, but they were, you know, they were supported. So what we find these days is that, you know, in a bit to experiment, in a bit to be with the cool guys, I'm sure you'd listen to quite a number of, you know, songs in Nigeria and you hear things like, oh, I'm on Molly, I'm on this, uh, you know, they're said in our lyrics, we, we hear them all the time. And so people are using substances to, to cope, to cope with stress, to cope with pressure, to cope with tr trauma, to help themselves feel better, to cope with the stress of work. In fact, a lot of people, especially in high pressure environments, like the financial industry, are turning to substances of abuse to just deliver on the job. You know, all those jobs that they say, oh, I have targets, I have this, I have to keep walking like a horse. People are turning to crack, they're turning to cocaine, day in, day out. And so what we're also finding is that this generation will generally tell you that everybody's doing it, so why can't I? But unfortunately, when Nigerians do things, un they unfortunately overdo it. And so you may find that, you know, people abroad, you, they'll say, oh, I'm on, um, I'm just using one substance. By the time you do a urine drug test for an average Nigerian who says that I'm just using normal marijuana, and like Dr. Yusuf said, I'd said earlier about how it is that normal headache, what is normal marijuana? By the time you then do a urine test, you find out the, the entire panel of 14 substances lights up. And so what it means is that whoever the dealer is, is giving them substances that will make them get hooked and come back. How do we know? We're losing a lot of our youths to sudden deaths. We're losing a lot of youth, adults, and even old people to you know suicides. Because sometimes these people become suddenly par paranoid. They, they can jump. I don't know if anyone ever caught that video of a man that was on amphetamines in America and he just jumped on the next person at the bus stop and started eating him alive. So we would start to see, you know, abnormal things. We'll start to see people talk out of context. We'll start to see people break down. Quite a number of people, interestingly, are able to function because, you know, by the time you start telling people, oh, marijuana is bad, it causes psychosis. It does this, it does that. They'll say, oh, what of Snoop Dogg, now Snoop Lion? Who has used it for so many and you know interestingly i saw a news review a few days ago that he uses over over 100 wraps a day what works for one or what seems to work for one may not work for another person and so the signs again you may not be able to tell you may see an individual who is unable to come to work or fully do their work so they, they're absent at work or they're present at work or not getting anything done they are they're having different errors on the job you can see individuals with bloodshot eyes or individuals who are sweating even when the ac is you know cold you can see individuals who keep saying oh i want to go to the toilet like 10 times a day you can see people who keep wearing long sleeves they can't wear short sleeves because they have injected the entire place and they're already looking like you know the incredible hulk and so for different substances it's different sometimes you see people who come to work in the morning and they are reeking of alcohol because they have an alcohol use disorder. And so whether it's cigarettes, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cannabis, whether it's MDMAs, I mean, look at that news where they said they went to Ikorodu and they found the largest shipment of cocaine ever found anywhere in Africa. Nigeria, like I always say, we always lead the pack, but unfortunately, quite a number of times, it's in the negative sense. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It would have been great to get into the treatment, you know, how to, but um, the, the time is really short, but I'm sure that we're going to find a way to get the information from you and then give it to people, right? If people have people that they need to help or if they themselves need the help at this time. But thank you. At this time, I'll be handing over to Efosa. Uh, I think we're coming very close to the end of the event. Uh, thank you, everyone. All right, thank you so much, everyone. It has been very, very, very enlightening for me, and I'm sure all the attendees have picked up one or two things, or a lot of things from this session. I now know more a lot about these fields, but also have very specific uh, next step of how to sleep better, 
how to prevent backaches, how to prevent headaches, how to um, um, prevent stroke in future for me, how to prevent hypertension. So it's just a lot of information that I've noted down. I'm, I'm sure um, going forward, I can then stay healthy to achieve more. Uh, just before we wrap up, I'll just uh, give the opportunity to each of our panelists to just uh, give us a parting words. So maybe you have 30 seconds to one minute, just tell us one something that you think is very important that we should take note of uh, as we close. So I'll start from you, Dr. Abiri. All right, I think that, you know, the one thing I want to leave anyone with on this call is heal from your trauma. Um, Nigeria as an environment is very traumatic, but we also come from homes where trauma has been handed down to us. The way our parents spoke to us, the way people related with us, the way our co-workers, you know, relate with us, physical, emotional, sexual, psychological neglect, domestic violence, domestic abuse. A lot of people are going to, through traumatic experiences. And the longer you stay in those relationships, the more difficult it is for you to leave. Because after a while, you start thinking that it's about you. And, you know, you, you, you start to identify with the oppressor, pretty much the Stockholm syndrome. But it's important for you to find yourself, find yourself because your life is worth something and you shouldn't die. You shouldn't die, you know, trying to prove a point that someone else loves you. It's painful when I, you know, hear about traumatic experiences. It's painful when I see traumatic experiences. Two days ago, it was in the news that a man in Emo broke the arm of a child because the child did not let him sleep at night. Trauma, trauma everywhere. Um, if you see it, identify it, run from it, get help. And it is everybody's responsibility, please. Let's not, you know, keep putting the person who is suffering in bad lights. They didn't choose that life. They found themselves in that situation. And it is up to all of us to do what it is that we can to ensure that people who are traumatized, even us ourselves, get the help that we very much need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aguri, for those words. Um, I'm sure we're taking note of those. I'll hand over to you, Dr. Awosika to tell us 30 seconds to one minute, uh, final words. All right, thank you. Um, according to the theme of this, um, that um, stay healthy to achieve more. And as a physiotherapist, um, for you to be healthy is to be physically active. Avoid sedentary lifestyle. So it's very important that you get into, you involve yourself in physical activities that will task you, like exercising. Not necessarily, you don't necessarily need to go to the gym. You can take 10 to 20, 30 minutes in your compound to take a walk, brisk walking, because it's been found out that it's very effective. You know, it improves your cardiopulmonary endurance. So exercising and also, your ergonomics at workplace, um, we should improve our tables and chairs where we sit and work every day. Then our phone use should be reduced as much as possible. And if we don't have any choice to, uh, to reduce that, always try to make sure that your phones, your laptops, your devices are lifted to your high level to, to reduce the stress on the spine. And also, Diet, healthy living, eat, eating healthy, taking lots of vegetables and fruits and all of that. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Awosika. I'll hand over now to Dr. Mokodu. Uh, please, final words from your end. All right, thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, thanks for the privilege of your time and attention today for everyone. Um, it's been an honor. Um, I just want to say two just two there's a, a two two sayings so for me the first one is from a karateka and a, she's a life coach a karateka um what she said mama indigo and it's something i live by so i'm going to just say two things um two quotes from them different people so the first one mama indigo says the best thing you can do is to master the chaos in you Ladies and gentlemen, you are not thrown into the fire. You are the fire. So whatever it is that life throws at you, right? Nadem go tire, not you. 
and that should be your attitude towards facing everything right but them go tire not you go tire right and then secondly is also the chinese um um what do you call it um poem or it's, it's a poem or is a saying actually for once of a horseshoe nail right um uh, the first thing that he always is basically looking at an, the order of things how do things um present themselves in terms of how the 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 they tend to manifest. So for once of your horseshoe nail, basically it says that um, for, let me just read it out for all of us here. And it's, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's an allegory to how to deal with things or nip things in the bud. Um, if we find out whatever problem it is, or we'll have an inkling. Let's be, this is the first, let, I will say whistleblower, whistleblow on yourself, right? Let's be that you were overly cautious and better to always err on the side of caution that to think that you can chest it and eventually when it gets you know deb too debilitating we'll have ourselves to blame right so um it, it says like this it's actually in that chinese um poem called um for the want of a, of a nail it says for want of a nail the shoe was lost for want of a shoe the horse was lost for want of a horse the rider was lost for want of a rider the battle was lost for want of a battle, the entire kingdom was lost. And all for what? For want of a horseshoe nail that could have been ironed out in the beginning. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, the privilege of, of your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Mokodu. And quotes are noted, I'm sure we will also want to live by that. Uh, he also recommended uh, attendees in the chat box uh, a book, Can't Hurt Me. So, please take a look at that book and uh, learn more about this um, area. And lastly, i uh, hand over to you, Dr. Zubair, to give us your own final words. All right, I will say thank you for having me. Um, what are the parting words? I think those words have been said already, just to emphasize them. Staying healthy and um, more importantly, you have to, it, it is, it's an active process. Staying healthy is not being passive. You have to look out for it. You have to go for it. You have to go out to be healthy. You have to do it. You have to be doing something about it. And there is nothing that is normal. And there is this nothing that is not my portion. It's everybody's portion. It's the way you deal with it. And you are the, you had the active person in the whole process. It depends on how you look at it and do something about it. So people shouldn't look at things as it's normal. It's normal. It's normal. It's normal. There is nothing normal. You have to seek help and we should be our brother's keeper. We should be our neighbor's keeper. Look out for others. I think that is very important because most time when something is, when you're at the center of something, you hardly know it's happening to you, except your attention is drawn to it. So in the workplace, we should look out for others. I think that is very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zubar. And thank you to all our panelists. Uh, final words, heal from your trauma, be active, engage in physical activities, and eat healthy. Um, there's a quote, the best thing you can do is to master the chaos within you. I like that you, you are the fire. And lastly, uh, be your brother's keeper. Don't trivialize things. Actually seek help. So that being said, I'll thank you so much, but I'll allow Tony to do the vote of that. So handing over now to Tony. Um, that's all from my end. Tony, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fosa. Thank you, Bukola. Thank you to everyone who was part of putting this together. I know that I speak on behalf of everyone. Sorry, please give me a minute to fix the sound. We can't hear. Hi, Tony. We can't hear you. I think you're. If you tell me you can hear me now, I apologize. Ah, we can hear you now. Okay. 
I was saying thank you to all our panelists. I feel like we packed a year's worth of knowledge into a few minutes. I feel healthier in my mind, literally. And I believe I speak for everyone. You know how you just learn these things and you feel like, can I just shout it on the rooftop? Can I just tell everyone? That's the exact feeling I am having. And I believe that my colleagues will be saying the same thing wherever they are right now. We feel richer. We feel like we're on the path to being healthier. But most importantly, what, why we put this together is very important. And I think you've all helped us to achieve it. And it's a journey that has just begun. We're trying as an organization to emphasize preventive healthcare. We believe that if we can prevent illnesses, including all the ranges of illnesses, if we could prevent it, then it will reduce hospital visits, it will reduce maybe sudden death, stroke, and all the other things that we have mentioned today, mental health included. We want to know more, we want to be able to identify it. I work with HR and want to be able to identify, identify it early, train the managers to identify it on their teams as well, and offer the right support to people. So I'm certain that you'll be hearing from us again as individuals, as experts. We don't hope to refer people, but where it becomes necessary, we'll be happy to refer people for your counsel, for your guidance, and for your treatment where necessary. So once again, I want to say thank you. I think I cannot end my thanking everyone without saying thank you to our awesome partners, uh, Health Insurance, Aksam Ansad, ably represented by Dr. Ide here. I want to say thank you for your support on this. We appreciate your input and helping us put this together. We don't take it for granted. And of course, your support on the health insurance angle as well. We see your drive for preventive health care and want to keep pushing this conversation. So I'm, I'm assured we will knock on your door again. And when we do, we are assured you will answer us again. More importantly, we're going to put together some of the commonly asked or frequently asked questions. And we hope that you can indulge us in your spare time to give us some responses that we can document and continue these conversations. So we hope to do 2.0 and we look forward to having you and other enriching speakers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I see that um, Iomedia has put a form, an evaluation form, please, before you leave the call, would appreciate if you can just click on it. Um, and I wanted, um, I guess, the panelists to take a group photo. So if we could just, you know, smile. <laughs> Iomedia, okay, if you can uh, turn on your video, that would be great. And uh, yeah, we have to make this feel as, as in-person as possible, right? Awesome. I think I got it. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you.